Colonel Funds on it. Mr. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this report uh, is a compilation of all the school audits, 175 schools, uh, the internal funds audit. Um, uh, Suzy K was the supervisor, and also uh, she, assist, she assisted uh, Randy Law, our audit director, for this project. Um, and, and of course, 175 schools, it's a lot of school for us to audit every year. Uh, and they were done by all our auditors throughout the year, at the beginning part of the fiscal year, before uh, uh, they start to do the performance audit. So um, Susie K is here. Uh, she's going to give you a quick presentation of the result of this audit. Susie? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So what we're going to do here is I'm just going to go through kind of a, a brief presentation, give you the highlights of that 550 page report that you have as part of your agenda packet. You also <laughs> received a uh, just the front piece is the management letter that's about 23, 24 pages. And that kind of is what we're going to be summarizing here in this report. So we're going to start with kind of the legislative requirements of why we do these audits. It's part of SBE rule and by reference the Red Book that every year we're required to audit the internal funds. And what we do is we test transactions for the validity, completeness, accuracy, and we also look to make sure the internal controls we are in place and that we test them to determine their effectiveness as well. To give you some background on internal funds, a lot of people who might be new, they go, what are internal funds? Well, those are the monies that are collected at and expended at a school. So think about whenever you've had a child go on a field trip or you go to a football game, all of those monies that are sent to the school or collected at an event, those are collected and deposited into what we know as internal funds. They're monies that we use for financing activities that are not otherwise funded through our general budget. The district, Mr. Chu said 175, we actually are down to 174 schools with internal funds. Odyssey Middle School was closed back at the end of fiscal year 18. And as you can see on that slide, the next slide you'll see just kind of the overview of the amount of revenues and disbursements each year that occurred during 2019. At the end of uh, June 30th, all of the schools together, there was a total of 20, just about, just shy of $21 million as a balance. The next slide is actually just for informational purposes. It gives you kind of an overview, shows you how the average school balance occurs by area, by level. Um, it's interesting to note that the uh, highest school, the balance with the highest school was Jupiter High School at the end of last year with a balance of 1.2 million. Um, the low balance of West Tech is kind of misleading since it was such a new school that they only had $56 as a balance. Uh, Crossroads Academy had one point, had 1,400 in their account. So when you look at the next slide, one of the things I just, this is more information for your purpose. Uh, it shows you the amount of revenues over the last, since we've started doing this in 2004 from this office as long as also with the number of schools. And while you see that the number of schools increased and also the amount of revenues collected have increased, it's interesting to note that I believe at most we've increased our audit staff by one over that time. So to get into the conclusions, over the last five years, you can see there's been a uh, trending down of the total number of conclusions that we find at each school. You need to understand that when we report number of conclusions, we're talking about the number of schools within that had that particular situation. So the schools may change from year to year, the conclusion may be the same, but you'll have different schools, some will correct and then some will pick up. We're not looking at individuals. We look at increases and decreases. 
and some of the things that might cause a school to all of a sudden have a con you know new conclusions is they might have new treasurers, they might have new principals. So in fiscal year 19, we ended with 38 schools with no reportable findings. And of those, I think it's important to point out that 19 of those had no reportable findings for the past two years and 10 of those schools actually have gone three years in a row now without any reportable findings. We always, when we get a school that has no significant findings, we always send an email to the principal as well as to the regional uh, directors letting them know and congratulating them. Um, as far as schools with repeated non-compliances, those are sent at the end of every year. We send a listing to the Department of Employee and Labor Relations. And we do that in order to give the district, uh, assist the district in helping them to support staff with additional training and working with the school treasurers. So going into more detail of what some of the, to summarize some of the conclusions that were found during fiscal year 19, so we start, we look at disbursement transactions. There was a total of $84 million that were dispersed throughout fiscal year 19 at all the schools. Another 14 million came through the P-card. Some of the P-card transactions you have to understand may overlap with that 84 million, depending on how they're funded. Some P-cards are funded through internal funds. There was no supporting documentation for the, no meaning no invoice or paid receipt at 10 different schools that we visited this year. There were, at 57 schools, we also encountered insufficient documentation on some of our sample transactions. Moving forward, we also look at the authorization of a transaction to determine whether it's been properly authorized or pre-approved by the principal. Uh, the district requires that any large purchase over $1,000 needs a signed purchase order by the principal. And at 47 schools, we encounter, in our samples, we encountered no purchase order for a large purchase. Another situation that we encounter periodically, but it's improved quite a bit over the years, is having contracts that are signed by staff other than the principal a lot of times a school sponsor will, without thinking, sign for a fundraising event or perhaps a yearbook contract, not realizing that only the principal is the person responsible for signing for the school. Another area in disbursement transactions has to do with vendors performing services on campus. This also ties into the previous report that you heard from the, the band audit because Vendors who come on campus are also required to have background clearances. There's some different uh, means. They have to be fingerprinted um, as well as once they come on campus, then they have to be cleared through the Raptor system on campus as well if they don't have that vendor badge. So there's many different aspects to the background clearance. And as Mr. Chu said, we are in the process of looking uh, at a more expanded version of that, you know, we're gonna give you a more expanded look at that situation in the future. At uh, 21 schools, we came across uh, situations where the consultant agreement had not been prepared for a vendor who came on campus. And we look at that as not having any evidence that that vendor had been cleared because there is a part of the vendor contract that the principal and the vendor are both attesting to the fact that he has gone through that clearance process. And at 17 of the schools, the agreements were just not properly executed. There was missing signatures, dates, hourly rates, which again is procedural, but it does have its consequences in the long run. We also move forward, we'll look at revenue from the side of money collections. There was 85 million in all the schools that were collected throughout fiscal year 19. So as far as compliance with money collection procedures, 
uh, 19 schools, we had encountered samples and where the money was not timely deposited. And that means that within the state rules that from the time a sponsor collects money, it is expected that that money is deposited to the bank within five working days. And our own district actually requires that money has to be placed into the drop safe daily. So depending on whether it was the staff member holding the money, uh, it could have been anywhere delayed from one to 170 days. There was an average of about 12 working days overall, the different exceptions. Um, this, this, this finding has improved immensely over the years and continues to decrease. People are becoming more aware of the rules. Um, the fundraising activities, uh, was mentioned also in the band report that some of the non-compliance for fundraising that we're seeing during the band audit, we see at every school. It, it's pretty consistent across the district. The non-compliances usually are related to procedural of not taking the online training. Uh, they may not have the prior authorization to hold a fundraiser where they've had the principal sign the uh, fundraising application for her to know that that event is about to take place. Um, there might be insufficient or lack of documentation uh, missing sales item inventory reports. And then sometimes we encounter inaccurate information in that they may have a sales item inventory report, but there's not enough, uh, the information was not applied properly on the report for us to reconcile revenues from the collections. The online training activity um, is required by sponsors to take annually. And at 27 of the schools, we encountered where the sponsors, again, you know, had failed to take the annual training. However, five of those schools, I should note that even though they didn't take the training, all of the documentation was in place and was proper and correct. The lack of authorization, as we just, de just described, could be missing forms, uh, lack of signatures, and then the in going ahead on the insufficient or lack of documentation as we already described. It just means that it makes it, we don't have any means to reconcile collections. And that's the primary reason a lot of people don't understand the purpose of the documentation. And, and that's becoming more known with more education. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead all the way to leasing at this point. And with the leasing of school facilities where we lease our schools out to local community organizations, the automation that we have, uh, we now have in place with Tririga has solved many of the former problems we had with leasing procedures, but they don't solve these particular two. These are still people problems. The lease agreements, uh, 32 schools were not properly signed. And that could mean either their signatures were missing. We might not have been able to find the actual uh, signed lease. It's still required that the lessee needs to come in and sign this lease as well as the principal to uh, make it a binding document. And it must have a witness signature as well. We also encountered situations at 21 schools where 48, you know, were the payment was not received as required by policy 48 hours in advance. And this occurs most of the time where we have schools with long-term leases, such as uh, a church lease where they're there every week and they might break the lease up monthly and allow them to pay each month. So it's, that's just, these are just kind of common niggling problems that continue. We added an a extra step this year when we went out to the schools, we expanded a little bit on student safety with regards to our after school programming. Uh, the after school programming is offered at 93 of our elementary schools and it's a fee based program and we always do review revenue and that's been spot on for years now. Um, one of the things though that we 
did go back and check that we haven't for a few years is whether or not students are being signed out properly um, to whether the registration forms are complete. And as you can see on this uh, slide, we did encounter some situations of illegible signatures on the sign out sheets. The district actually has a rule in their procedure that they're supposed to have a signature card to verify illegible signatures. And in the situations where we could not determine who signed out that child, that was a situation where there was no signature card on file either. Uh, incomplete registration forms. That's very important because they include custody and health information. We don't want to be violating a custody order from the courts if we sign out a child to the wrong parent. And then there were discrepancies also between the attendance sheets and the sign out sheets. And what that problem can lead to, especially where we receive subsidy reimbursements, is those documents need to be very accurate because the subsidy reimbursements are based a lot on the attendance. And if they come in and do their own audit and find problems, then we may lose some of that reimbursement. And that is the best way to summarize 550 pages. <laughs> and Mr. Dixon has a question. Yes, Mike. You're on mute, Mr. Dixon. <laughs> Mr. Dixon, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Mike, you're on, there you go. I got it, sorry. Um, there's a five-year summary in the report here that I, and I just wanna ask you a question about what you just talked about. The after-school programming student records. Was there a major emphasis this year on that particular area versus prior years? Yes, sir. We we had backed off of, we, we always change our focus each year into different areas. Obviously, this is a very large program and it's hard for us to look at every area every year. This particular one we've picked back up on this year. Okay, is that why, why the prior years were so low versus this year? Yes, sir. Okay, I have another other question. In your conclusions, in your conclusions, you give us number of schools. Uh, you know, the 39, the 10 that had three years in a row with no reporting, etc. Do you have another in your report? And I apologize if it's in there because I didn't, I didn't get through the whole report on this one. But is there an, is there an emphasis on schools that are repeatedly issues coming up that are included in the non-compliance? that we haven't just heard in your compliance, in your conclusions? We, we do track that information. I won't say that it's in this specific uh, published document. We do provide the Department of Employee and Labor Relations with a memo that has all of the information detailed out as to specific people and events that are repeating so that they can address it. And, and in dollars also? Uh, dollars, no, but that can be compiled if necessary. Well, do you think it's material to have dollars related in this process? A lot of the repeat, I don't know. Events, I don't yeah, know. A, a lot of the repeat events probably don't, aren't so much dollar as much as procedural. Well, there's $85 million going through this process. I was just wondering how much, how many, you know, dollar wise, I know the number of schools, but I understand. Um, uh, okay, just a comment. All right, Randy. Yeah. Uh, just answer uh, uh, the question. Uh, during the, uh, the school uh, development audit, we continuously, constantly uh, adjust our audit steps and the areas focus based on the new emerging issues identified during the year. So uh, if there's anything new, then we will make adjustments to our audit steps and also the area focus. The after school program is one of the area that we make adjustment this year. That's number one. Number two is when we send the information to our personnel for their review, like uh, they are repeated on compliance, we have the uh, findings sent to them too. So that also includes the data amount. 
Okay. Thank, anyway, you. thank you. Other comments or questions? Yes. Of the members? Yes. Okay. Debbie Mark. Manzo. Okay. So, Debbie and then Mark. Since I've been on this audit committee, which I think has been three years now, it seems like um, the internal funds audit continues to be a repetitive issue. So I'm just wondering if there can be a, a committee with principals and the finance staff just to review the policies and maybe make some recommendations. Um, just a thought, that's all. I don't know if anyone has any comments about it. Nancy or Mike might want to comment about what we've done in the past on that. Uh, well, this is Nancy. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, we do have uh, ELM training that is is set to go for. I, I know we, we keep saying we train, 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 um, but it is set to go again for FY twenty one in um, early July. Uh, we have a checklist for the principals. We have principal training. We have sponsor training. Um, I, I don't think it's lack of um, providing the information that is needed. Uh, we do cover uh, the most common uh, internal account audit findings to make sure that, you know, we stress the things that they should be watching for. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, the, the, the schools, their primary objective is to teach the children. So I, I don't know how high up on the, um, you know, I, I there's only so much that we can do from the accounting standpoint. Um, if the recommendation from the audit committee is to to gather up some principals and sponsors and um, have a meeting to, to break down all of the internal account procedures that we have in place, uh, we can go ahead and do that. Many of the rules and forms and, and things that we have come up with is related to um, issues that were uh, discovered by the, the IG's office. And that's why we have implemented so many things that, that, that the schools need to, to go through. Um, so if you all decide that you want us to go ahead and, and try and meet with the principals and, and all, we, we'd be happy to do that. Um, it, it, it's not for a lack of training. Like I said, <laughs> we do, we have a five page checklist for the principals that gives them a high level of things to look for. It goes through each of our chapters of our internal accounts manual. Um, not all of our principals have taken the training. Um, it's been out there for a couple of years now. Um, we are, we do remind them on the, remember I have that PFAC report. Um, the, the training is listed on there. Um, it tells them whether they are in compliance and how many people on their staff have taken the training. So, um, I don't know if that answers. Yeah. Your okay. And Mark. That, yeah. <laughs> Probably that's too much information. And that's why I was thinking that there is so much, and and you're right. We always hear that with every report that their number one um, uh, goal is to and responsibility is to teach the kids. But there's still all these funds and the, and that the internal funds that are an issue and they're responsible for. And that's why I was thinking maybe with some of the policies that uh, maybe just a group, some subcommittee could get together and the, from the principal's perspective or whoever is having to deal with all these internal funds that maybe there's some things that can be um, streamlined. So they may have some good recommendations. Just, just a thought, that's all, um, thank you. The only thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is that Streamlining would mean taking out some of the things that we're trying to put in place to keep the internal controls, you know, kind of tight. Um, I, I would be interested to see if the dollar amounts that we're talking about that the IG is finding, if they're, you know, if, if we're, how much we're talking about, because uh, I know that of the $80 million, uh, about 30 million of it is after school program, which I believe the, the IG said the after school program dollars, the revenue and all of that is, is, is tight. Uh, you know, we were able to reconcile most of that without any issues. So um, I, I don't know what the dollars are that we're talking about before we, you know, try and, and come up with a whole lot of changes. Okay. Mark, you've been real patient. Uh, 
Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add to that monetary amount. I mean, especially the disbursements and receipts, the the actual uh, non-compliance is not necessarily informative when you don't know the monetary amounts. The, you know, inadequate uh, support for disbursements, if it goes up by 54, but it's mostly $5 items, is not necessarily as important as if you had one item that was a huge amount of money. So it'd be nice to see the monetary amounts for, especially for those two areas. I agree. I agree. All right. Uh, Dave, this, this is Kathy Weigel. I'm sorry you don't have my visual, but uh, as a former, as a former principal for 20 years, you have to realize too, that they have, depends on how big the school is. You have uh, an inordinate amount of uh, faculty and staff that go through your internal accounts. And sometimes they don't follow the rules. And obviously, then we'll address that. But then that can become a finding. I mean, I prided myself on having no findings. and as But as a high school principal uh, for, I think it was 14 years, I think I only came in around four times where I had no findings at all. Whereas at a middle school principal, I never had findings. So it has to do with we're running big cities. And also, uh, as it was pointed out by our Nancy, that we do other things in addition to disperse money. Uh, you try your best, and certainly we could. You could get committees together, but at this point, I would say the principals have so many things to do. It's just a matter of you keep up with everything you can as much as you can, and try to make sure that you are that no one is making off with the money, and that you're as procedurally correct as you can be. So this was more of a comment on getting a, the bigger picture uh, with 200 or more employees, as I had in most of my schools. It was uh, a daunting task to make sure everybody's following every procedure. And boy, when they weren't appropriate, I was certainly right there to make that correction myself. But sometimes it's a little too little too late. So that just sort of adds a perspective, I hope, for you. Your input, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to add it that um, since we took on the audits of the internal funds um, uh, in 2004, I think we have come a long way. Uh, when I attended the, the national uh, great uh, city school um, uh, meeting, that I could compare our school to to, the, to others, our counterpart um, through the nation. Um, Palm Beach County has one of the very most stringent and comprehensive uh, control system that much better than everybody. So I, I think we are very proud of that. Uh, if you see there's a color chart right in front of the, the PowerPoint presentation. This gives you a snapshot of what's happening during the last five years for all the schools. So the number of findings for all the schools had pretty much level off. So um, a lot of time, the findings occur not because of we have don't have control. Um, I think it could due to uh, negligence of uh, staff, or sometimes they don't they don't they just don't understand uh, the, the needed control in there. And then we have talked we have talked with uh, we have discussed with uh, accounting with. Uh, 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 and, and, and other staff, uh, we have good training program. It's just the long compliance by some specific staff. And then um, we even talk with personnel. One way to help them out is to, to give them a list of those people who consistently violate the rules. So I think that we pretty much put a good dent on the long compliance. Uh, if they still exist, then personnel has to do something. It is their job. So if you look at the, the number of schools without findings, it keeps going up. Uh, I think that is that need to be uh, commanded. Um, uh, I, I think that we are pretty much come to a plateau that long compliance will be there no matter what. Uh, and, and then so we just have to be more creative to shift the focus on the areas that need help because we don't have enough people. We only have a short time time frame to do the audit. 
and uh, I, I think we are we are doing as much as we could. We're doing the testing, and then uh, in terms of uh, the area we focus on, like Mr. D uh, Dixon had a good question regarding the other care program. The program was in big trouble years ago. We spent a lot of time, and then it has come a long way. We see the findings dropping very much. So last couple of years, we discussed with uh, among ourselves. So some staff auditor uh, realized that well, uh, uh, aftercare program had not been had not been our focus for some time. Let's go back and see what happened. So we just have to try and error. So I, I think that we just have to use our resources in a more efficient way. Not that we want to ignore or pick on certain program. We just need to make sure that we have a good coverage and a certain cover level. Thank you. Hey, Michael, then Nancy, then we've got to move on. No, I don't have any additional comment. Thank you, David. Okay. Nancy? Um, I, I would like to mention that the IG uh, was uh, provided us with the names of the sponsors that had some of the issues um, this year. Uh, for the first time, normally it always goes to professional standards. So um, we are going to uh, attempt to contact the schools and make sure those they they focus on their training and you know we'll try and follow up with the schools as well, just to see that the the common offenders um, can potentially take the training early so that maybe it, it won't happen again. But we're going to try. <laughs> no guarantees. Last comment, Mike Burke. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to echo Mr. Chu's uh, comments and sentiments. I think we've had a very good partnership over the years to, to address these challenges. Uh, I just, you want to remind the committee, you know, you heard recently, we have a $3 billion plus budget and we had a clean audit with no findings from both our external financial auditor, RSM, and recently the Florida Auditor General. Uh, this, you know, the, the nature of internal accounts, I would definitely, what Mr. Chu said, we've gone above and beyond a lot what other districts do. And the more requirements we lay out there, potentially the more uh, findings you may get as a result. So I kind of welcome Ms. Manzo's suggestion, uh, maybe not right away because schools are so focused on trying to reopen in the fall, but when things settle down a little bit, it, we may be at a good point to kind of uh, reset and go through our requirements and, and get that principal perspective to see what what may be overly uh, arduous or just you know not realistic, and then we'd have to you know the IG of course would have to be a part of that conversation to see you know which controls do we really feel like we have to hang on to, and are there others that maybe are, are not practical? Uh, and I think that is just healthy to to kind of check in once in a while. Uh, but this this is a challenge. You know, it's a decentralized approach. You've got eighty four million dollars running through the schools sometimes in in increments of change, right? There's a lot of volume and transaction behind penny fundraisers to everything else. Um, and there's turnover, you know, these sponsors, that's basically our teachers. So any teacher that has a club or wants to go on a trip or whatever, you know, we now have that training in place. We've, Ms. Samuels has done an excellent job of putting all this training online so that we also can, we can audit that. We know who's participated, who's completed the courses. Uh, but I can tell you, when you look at those courses from a principal's perspective, we're putting hours and hours of training out there. We expect them to complete. And that, that is just one facet of their job. You know, they've got training across the board. Uh, so I, I think I just want to say, uh, recognize the great partnership we've had with our inspector general's office to make improvements. I agree with Mr. Chu that it seems like we, you know, we, some level of findings seem to be inevitable, but that's, that's how we tailor our work going forward and try to continuously improve. And, uh, Again, I do think it's a good suggestion and something that when uh, the dust settles a little bit around the district and we're into some type of normal routine again, uh, we could have that conversation and bring back maybe some recommendations as a result to this committee. So thank you, Mr. Talley. I appreciate the uh, having a chance to get a word in there. Thank you. I think we've had some great comments on this. We need to move on. I accept a motion to approve the report. Chair Talley, I'd like to make a motion. This is Debbie Manzo, but before I make a motion, I don't want to incorporate the committee into my motion, my motion. So if we could just, if, if uh, Mr. Burke would put that on a, a to-do list or a tickler list about, you know, coming back with recommendations, that's wonderful. But I will make a motion to accept um, the internal funds audit report. 
Uh, I'll, second. I'll second. Okay. <laughs> Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed unanimously. Okay, we're going to move on to 8.1 Comprehensive Risk Assessment Presentation. Mr. Chu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I know that we're running out of time. I still like to have Susie K to give you a quick, quick update uh, because this is a new requirement uh, for us. Uh, Susie? Thank you, Mr. Chu. I will give you the very quick, brief overview. Um, what we're going to talk about really quickly is the legislative requirements, what is a risk assessment, what will be assessed, and how will we proceed. So as far as give you the, just a really brief background, back in 2014, the Auditor General presented to the Joint Audit Legislative Auditing Committee that um, during one of their presentations that they felt that uh, districts needed of a certain size needed to hire an internal auditor. And that they also asked them to produce legislation that would require districts to have internal controls. Not that I could imagine them not having them. Moved fast forward to 2018 and the law was passed, which then did actually mandate that any district with more than $500 million in all revenues, and that included grants, federal, and anything like that, uh, was mandated that they must hire an internal auditor that reports directly to the school board. And then as part of that law, it required that that internal auditor was also to perform a comprehensive risk assessment every five years. So what exactly is a risk assessment? So, on the slide, you can see there the more formal definition of a risk assessment, but to put it in a more simpler way, it's identifying activities in each or any of the, you know, the departments at a functional level and asking questions like, what could go wrong? Do we care? What can we do to prevent those activities from being a problem? Those are your controls. And then look forward and say, you know, do we already have controls in place to mitigate those events? And the final outcome of that risk assessment would be as to compile, catalog, however you want to list it, and possibly rank out those events in order of magnitude and likelihood. How much impact will it have? We already have a lot of controls in place. You know, what, what, what is a control? Segregation of duties. We have safety equipment on school buses. We have teacher certifications. All of those are different types of controls that are in place for different eventualities. So as far as this comprehensive event, what will be assessed? The original legislation was actually focused on financial operations when they first started discussing it, but the final law expanded it to all areas of operation. So Based on our preliminary research, we're going to be just starting probably with the financial and non-academic uh, operations areas. Uh, it, it, it re the reality of it is, is our board really does have, we, our district has some very good controls in place all across the district, but they're documented individually in their own departments and part of what I see this assessment will be is giving it a one centralized um, compilation. And then when we're done, we'll be able to inform management any areas that we think need attention. And it'll also help to develop our annual work plan as we move forward into the next couple of years. And as far as our, how we were gonna proceed, uh, we've already been surveying different methodologies used by other school districts, similar size within the state of Florida that have an audit function. As I mentioned, our phase one focus is going to be on financial and non-academic operations. Further down the road, we can add academic operations once we have more information on that. When we look to rank risk, we always look at different attributes, including program size, uh, number of personnel, how many students might be affected, um, and any prior audits of that area that we'll also rely on. We might look to see if there's a new department that just created. So there's many different ways to approach this. This is just informational for the committee to let them know that this is coming down the road. It's, 
um, and that we're just in the beginning phases of it. We, we listed just some examples of things that just in 2021, we know just through COVID are gonna be creating new problems for the district and they have to be addressed. So if you have any questions on this, since I know we're tight for time, I will stop that at this point. Thank you, Ms. Kay. By the way, thank you for both of your presentations. They were very well done. Are there any uh, comments or questions from our committee? Yes, Mark? Uh, I just have a comment that, that, that a lot of this is, is kind of redundant because the, you know, under general auditing standards, for internal auditors and external auditors, the uh, these risk assessments are already done on a yearly basis. So it's 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 kind of like a new legislative uh, updates, but but a lot of these procedures are already done. Correct. For internal audits. Right. Correct. It's just a matter of just doing a single compilation. Yeah. That's all I have. Mr. Chu, did you have anything? Uh, no, no. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Are there any further questions of the committee members? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the report. Uh, Mark Weigel. here, I uh, to approve. Seconded by Weigel. Great. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed unanimously. All right, 9.1, revised audit procedure manual draft. Mr. Chu. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> this is uh, an, an FII item uh, for the audit committee. Um, the manual has been existing uh, ever since day one that uh, this office was formed. And again, uh, throughout the, the time, uh, we may want to amend, update some of them. And then a lot of them were because of the comments coming from the peer review. So we pretty much put them together and uh, give this to all the committee uh, for for your input. Uh, we did not have much uh, modification to the existing one, just some minor one, mm -hmm. uh, clean up some forms and process. So this is uh, for your uh, review and approval if you want to. Okay, comments, uh, Randy? Uh, in addition to uh, uh, responding to the peer reviewers comment one of the major changes to this uh, procedure menu is to update all the new requirements by the uh, updated yellow book meaning the uh, government ordinary standards issued in 2010. Okay, further comments questions i'll accept a motion to approve the i have a comment yes mark on on i have a problem with uh page two where it says for for special projects which are limited in depth and scope i.e non-audit services is our policy to follow government auditing standards as much as practical and the problem i have with that is you're going to follow auditing standards for a non-audit procedure, which doesn't make any sense. And, and it says as much as practical. I believe that should be under some sort of the uh, Institute of Internal Audits or, or some sort of IG to follow some sort of professional standard by them. Because to me, it, just, it doesn't sound like you're really following any standard for those type of projects. Any comments from staff, Mr. Chu? Um, I know if they are non audit, we call it, they are not audit, uh, like for special projects, we are not subject to the yellow book requirements. However, uh, there are certain things required for the yellow book uh, to ensure the quality of, of the projects. So we stay, still want to adhere to it rather than to do everything, anything we want. So I think that this this, this sentence here uh, refers to the quality control of the work product. Um, a lot of times there are formality in the report to say to, of the wordings, like uh, something like uh, uh, this audit was uh, in full compliance with auditing standard, blah, 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 blah. All those are standardized requirements provided that 
we pass to the peer. So I, since we pass the peer, and then uh, we want to guarantee our work is consistent uh, with the requirements. And the most important part is the quality control, which is the supervision, uh, 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 deal professional care, uh, independence, objectivity. So I think we could clarify it just to be more specific. Uh, like we need to be uh, objective, independent, uh, uh, adequate supervision, and those quality control aspects uh, to it. Okay, response. It, 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 I, I just believe it should state some sort of, you're using some sort of professional standard for those projects that don't fall under audit. And by stating that you're going to use auditing standards to conduct a engagement that's non-audit, it just doesn't make sense to me. There's a professional standard where under the, the internal auditors or the IG organizations that would probably be better to state that you'd follow those. Okay. Uh, Randy, you have anything to add? Michael, Dixon. No, we, 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 we will be listening and then to take a look in more detail and see uh, how to make adjustment to the language uh, to address uh, Mr. Uh, Bartmaster's uh, uh, concern. But basically, uh, what we try to say is uh, like what Mr. Chu said, we want to make sure that uh, all the uh, audit and special reviews have the proper supervision, independence, 